What is up, heroes? This is Midnight Zero, and welcome back to Let's Play Professor Layton in the Curious Village Blind. In the last episode, well, actually, I'm gonna let the I'm gonna let the game do a little bit of the talking because actually, I could use a little bit of refresher myself. I got myself to to peel away from Professor Layton for a few days and tend to some other things, and I'm now back and excited to get back into it. But a refresher of the story would be a little bit nice. So, in the course of their afternoon-long investigation through Saint Mysterium, Luke and Layton stumble upon a rumor about some mysterious kidnappings. The professor has a hunch that Raymond's disappearance and these kidnappings must be connected. Also, wow, look at that person in the background. That's not something we had access to without these recap segments. In a quest for further details, the intrepid pair, what a word, intrepid, continue their search of a Saint, Myster of Saint Mysterio into the night. And so we had just talked to Deke, and uh, he let us know that Beatrice might have found this um, this watch of interest, so Alright, um, and we had solved a couple puzzles. There's the star one, which was interesting to say the least And there was that alien one that stumped me. I have been thinking about it still haven't really had any sort of breakthrough I'm trying to kind of reverse engineer it where it's like What are some things that people use? Uh, that are paper and have some line denoting where a hole in that paper is Right? Like, why would that be helpful to someone in the first place? And hoping that that leads me down the right track? But, like I said, I haven't exactly found anything helpful, so... Yep, um, now let's head back to the inn. Where exactly is the inn again? I believe it, we go to the square, and then... Is it here? No, I think it's back. This is the inn. Alright, Beatrice, what you got for us? Not quite. I heard word that you found a wristwatch out by the entrance to the park. Oh, that old thing? Does it belong to you, Professor? Oh, no, it's Gerard's. He dropped it today while wandering about town and asked me to help him find it. Why am I not surprised? <laughs> that man sheds more stuff than a cat sitting by a fireplace. Wow, yikes. <laughs> what an analogy. Alright, then, here's that watch. You know, it figures that it belongs to Gerard. I was just thinking to myself, the Professor is far too fashionable to wear this old thing. Thank you very much. Love it. Gotta love the, the backhanded compliment slash insult, you know? Alright. Something I had actually also been um, wanting to check in on as well was the gizmos. Because we should have obtained a couple more, and we are pretty close. I dare say we are one gizmo away, which is crazy because <laughs> I'm pretty sure that alien puzzle would be the one to put it over the edge. Nevertheless, we now have the watch, so we should be able to go and give it to Gerard, who will then let us through here. Oh, so you found my watch, did you? But of course, a gentleman always helps those in distress. <laughs> Speaking of which, we're still quite worried about Raymond's whereabouts and should probably return to our search now. Yep, St. Mysterio is strange like that. Despite its size, it can be quite challenging to find people. Sometimes it feels like running in a darn maze. <laughs> Speaking of mazes, you ever heard this one, Sonny? Of course. But we really must be... <clears throat> Have you ever heard of this one, Sonny? <laughs> Number 47. On the run. 40 pick rats. Wow, okay. We got quite a bit going on here. I, I, so, I want to say I love that art of the bandit or whatever it is in the lower right corner. A mysterious bandit is on the... On the lamb? Is on the lamb? And trying to escape the police who are hot on his trail. His entrance into this part of town is marked with an arrow. This particular bandit follows a peculiar creed and has vowed never to go backward or turn around. Additionally, whenever he meets an intersection, he will always turn left or right. Now, as you can see from the map, this part of town has multiple exits, which are labeled A through G. Of all the exits here, which one will the bandit never be able to pass through? Absolutely never. Okay, so this is tough because we kind of need to see which are which are possible, right? Or we could think about it in terms of which well, which route is never available. So let's think here. If he starts here and he comes here, right? He can either go left or right, meaning he could never I don't want to redraw a circle. I'm just taking notes. Just taking notes. Oh, it's gonna make me start over again. Okay, well, regardless, um we, we can clear that. So when he approaches the first intersection, right, 
He will never go this way. He can either go left or right. However, he could make his way to this intersection if instead he went this way and then left and then left. So he could eventually make his way here and then proceed to go this way. That's the type of thing I'm trying to find right now. I guess it's pretty clear that if you go in here and turn left and then turn left, you could go here. My question would be, oh, if, if you turn right and go left, does this, sorry, my, I got it a little stuck there. This intersection here, well, I guess it technically counts as an intersection, right? So you would have to go left and then you could go right and then you could go left. So you could get to F, you could turn right, you could turn left to go to E. You could not go straight. So let's see how we can get to D. We've ruled out E, F, and G at this point. We can probably also rule out A, right? You can turn right, right, and then right, and you get to A. If you turn left, then you could turn left here, I guess, then right, then right, then left, then, why does, why does that keep happening? It may prove to be difficult to get to B. We'll need to check on that. But at the moment, it's either D, C, or B. Let's see here. Again, if we go right and then left and then right and then left and then right, that's not right, but if we go left and then we come up here by turning right, then we can turn right, left, and then we could go right to get to C. So we could get to C, we could go left and then go right to get to D. So we've, we've shown pathways now that go to G, F, E, D, C, and A. So we know it has to be B. Unless I did one of these pathways incorrectly and didn't follow the rules they provide. But regardless of, based on how this is structured, right? I can never approach B this way. Because if I approach B in this manner, then I get to this intersection here and need to turn left or right. So I can't go directly towards B. So if I want to get to B, I need to approach it this way or I need to approach it this way. And is that possible? Basically, can I get to a point where turning into this route here is turning right or left? And I don't think that's the case. I don't think just looking at the routes, I can ever get to a point where I would be entering the this segment of the map in that manner because with this intersection here I'm always forced to if I approach from the bottom to turn left and if so I then must come up to this intersection where I could turn right but then again I can't approach in from there so I would have to go this way but again I can't go that way because of how I'm approaching it unless no I, I yeah I mean it's got to be B at this point I'm trying to come up with a more reasonable way of looking at it, but we've exhausted the other answers, so I feel pretty good about it. Here's my answer. Let's see how it goes though. Alright, and we got it correct. Every puzzle has an answer. I wonder if they're just gonna say to exhaust all the options. That's right, as you can see from the diagram with the bandit must turn. Every time he approaches an intersection, the ways he can move through the town are set. As a result, no matter how he approaches B, he'll never be able to leave through there. Interesting. That's a really cool diagram. You're a sharp one, Sonny. <laughs> you know, if you're looking for someone, you should ask around at the inner cafe. As you know, the inn is right by the entrance to the village. The cafe is right at the fork in the road just north of here. We've already searched the inn, but checking the cafe sounds like a great idea. We'll be sure to stop by, as if that wasn't already the plan. Well then, I'm off to bed. An old man needs his beauty rest. Thanks again for your help. Yeah, I gotta take care of all three chins you got there. <laughs> Think nothing of it, sir. A cream rug. We'll give it to Layton. Okay. So let's finally progress forward towards the cafe. We have the cat and the mouse again. There are potentially new puzzles. I do want to briefly take a look at the inn rooms to see what we can do here. You can place furnishings you've collected in either Luke's or Professor Layton's room. Use your stylus to move an item. When you move an item, 
It appears on the top screen in the room in which you placed it. The actual location of an item within the room is decided for you. Both Luke and Professor Layton will comment on how the furnishing of their rooms is coming along. Your goal is to arrange the ideal living space for both of them. You can check how they feel about the rooms by tapping their icons on the touchscreen. Each time you obtain a new item, you'll be asked which room to put it in. You can always go back and change the layout of items, so don't think too hard about their locations. If you get a new item when one of your rooms is full, it will be sent to the room with remaining space. When both Luke and the Professor are completely satisfied with their living quarters, something good will happen. Cool, so... I mean, it's clearly worthwhile. Um, <laughs> neither of them is very happy with the room as it seems. So, there are a few things in here, but it's still sort of empty. And what does Leighton have to say? Hmm, the place is still rather empty, isn't it? Okay, so to me, that indicates I really shouldn't even be worrying about this until I get plenty more items. But I did want to check on that, because it was, well, on my mind. Alright, let's see if the cat and mouse have anything new to add. Professor, there's a cat here! Aw, here, kitty kitty kitty! Animals are very dear to you, Luke, are they not? Luke, er... <laughs> Animals are very dear to you, are they not, Luke? Well, I have just the puzzle for you, then. Is this a new one? Cats and mice. I guess... I guess so. Five cats can catch five mice in five minutes. A lot of fives. With that in mind, how many cats does it take to catch 100 mice in 100 minutes? Ah, I see. So... So this is more of like a... Just kind of tricky conversion type problem. So, if you have five cats, they catch five mice in five minutes. Now, I'm sure what people are tempted to do is say, Oh, if you just divide the hundred mice in hundred minutes by five, which is all over the beginning of the question, you'd say twenty. It takes twenty cats um, to catch a hundred mice in a hundred minutes. But that's actually not going to be the case. Because if five cats are catching, a, catching mice at a rate of five every five minutes, and we're looking for a hundred in a hundred minutes, that's just... 20 minutes, right? Um, or 20 iterations of that five minutes. We don't need any more cats, we just need 20, we just need 100 minutes with those five cats. So, <laughs> yeah, this one's kind of kind of tricky. Also, I love the illustrations, they have so much character. So yeah, I'm pretty confident in five here, which is tricky, but is also very in line with what Professor Layton's puzzles have been like up until this point, so. Yeah, I feel, I feel good about that. How many cats does it take to catch 100 mice in 100 minutes? Yeah, if the same five cats are catching five every five minutes, then 100 minutes later they'll have caught 100, or I mean it's a mouse a minute, right? So yeah, we'll do that. Well, here's my guess. Come on, Luke. All right. Legends of Prentice, Prentice saves, saves the, the day. day. <laughs> so derpy, so dorky, so cute. <laughs> Five cats. Five cats can catch five mice in five minutes if that mouse hunt continues another five minutes. You can expect a total of ten, etc., etc. Yeah. Wonderful job there, Luke. And we got a painting scrap. Nice. Okay. Anything more? Anything hidden in any of these recesses? Okay. A hidden coin. How about the lamp in the ground on the stone? All right. Now we'll finally chat with you and see what you have to offer. Alright, Lucy. Good evening to you, sir. It's almost my bedtime, but I've got one more puzzle for you. Wanna see it? Sure! Of course! 1,000 times. 20 pick rats. What on earth is this message getting at? The following is written on a piece of paper you picked up. Blank is 1,000 times blank blank. To turn this strange message into a proper sentence, all you need to do is fill in the blanks with a single letter of the alphabet. But what letter could it be? You'll need to use the same letter for all three blanks. So, naturally, the, I mean, my thought process goes in a couple different ways. Um, it's gonna have to be some letter representing a number, and the two things that come to mind are bases uh, greater than 10, so something like hexadecimal or whatnot. Um, but even then, there's no single base number um, within you know the first 26 uh, letters of the alphabet that would represent a single digit that is 1,000 times 
a number that can be represented by two digits in that same base. So I don't think that's going to be the case. It could also be Roman numerals, but at the same time, nothing... I mean, when you repeat a Roman numeral, it's additive, right? So like XX is 20. So I can't see a single Roman numeral ever being 1,000 times that same Roman numeral repeated twice. What else could it be? It could be units. Yeah, I bet that's what it is. Um, because if you use the letter M, for example, a meter is 1,000 times a millimeter, which would be... Wait, wait, I'm pretty confident that's actually what they're going for. Because what came to mind, I mean, single letter units that are reasonably expect or like reasonably available, right? That people would know about. Um, not something like a Newton, for example. <laughs> um, but like liters, meters... Not, you know, inches, centimeters, feet, etc. It's got to be something that has one letter as an abbreviation. So, yeah, I think maybe grams, but no, no, that's obviously not. So, yeah, I'm going to try M here. Yeah, I like that. That should do it. All right. Another puzzle solved. Okay, one meter is equal to 1,000 millimeters. Great. How'd you like my puzzle? Pretty fun, right? You did such a good job. I'm gonna tell you a secret. I heard that there's a man-eating monster in the tower, and that's why everyone stays away. Not silly enough to think there's actually a monster inside, but the place is dangerous. So be careful in there, mister, <laughs> assuming already that we're actually gonna be going in there. All right, we'll give light in the bookcase. Interesting. Can we go in there? Nope. All right, then we'll we'll continue forward. We got this guy chilling out here, as opposed to his usual battle station. Hey, not looking for Raymond, are you? Yep, you're definitely looking for Raymond. So, you still haven't found the guy? Listen, streets here are dangerous at night. Crazy dangerous. You can't go running all over town with a kid. Because that's dangerous. Crazy dangerous. <laughs> I'm afraid I'm gonna have to punish your poor judgment with a puzzle, but you'll solve it, yeah? Of course. <laughs> That's too funny. Puzzle number 50. O-T-T-F? Question mark? Here you have a set of small paper cards. On each card is a single letter, but one of the cards is missing its letter. What letter belongs on the blank card? O-T-T-F? Question mark? S S E N T. Um, um, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think if there is a letter, or like, I mean, obviously, it's, you got to determine what the relationship is between the letters, right? And what I'm thinking is, hmm, it might be M. But I mean, it's not, it's not 100%, right? So my thought process right now, I'm trying to come up with some relationship between the top row of letters and the bottom row of letters. And it looks like for every bottom letter, the letter that it's related to, to the upper right of it. So in this case, if moving from left to right, the first S is related to the first T. And then the second S is related to the second T, the E related to the F, and then the N to the blank. The top row letter is always whatever letter comes after the bottom one. So in this case, you know, T comes after S and F comes after E. So M would come after, or no. <laughs> O would come after N. Um, gotta love the alphabet. So, O would be in the blank there. But I don't know if it's just... Hmm. 
I don't know where the other O would fit in. Do they want that to be a U as a result? Like, are they shuffled? In that the top row is a set of letters that come after, or the set of all the letters that are, you know, immediately after the row of bottom letters, right? So you have O that comes after N, you have F that comes after E, T that comes after S, T that comes after S, and then the blank one would actually be whatever comes after T, which would be U in this case. I actually think that might be the case. To me, that's a pretty well-evidenced relationship between the top row and the bottom row. So I think I'm going to go with that. Because I can't see anything else like a word to spell or a message or some sort of zigzag pattern going back and forth between the top row and the bottom row. I'm going to try you. That should do it. Let's see how it goes. That wasn't correct? I guess Frankly, not. I'm ashamed. Look for a pattern or a rule. I mean, I, I did, and I'm fairly confident I found one. <laughs> I'm fairly, fairly confident I found one. So, like, my, the, the pattern I saw, as I explained, was, you know, the top row and the bottom row are two separate sets, and the top row is the set of letters that come after each letter of the bottom row, and that would, that would work. Um, but I guess it's not what they intended. <laughs> so, so not quite, right? Um, try to find some other pattern or rule. Maybe it's one continuous row, right? So O, T, T, F, blank, S, S, E, N, T. They're just shown in this manner so that... So that we're able to um, visualize them all on the bottom screen. Hmm. I don't think it spells a word. I can't think of anyone, at least. Probably overthinking it to some degree. pattern. Hmm. Maybe it's O for the same reason I thought earlier where it's like, well, there's a, there's a row on the top and then a row on the bottom and moving from left to right. You know, that upper right relationship where the T comes after the S. And then the F comes after the E, and then so maybe the, the tile, the blank tile is what comes after N, but... But at the same time, I feel like they just happen to have them arranged this way. I don't know if this is just one way to display the cards, right? Like, or are they intentionally supposed to be set up this way? Like I have, oh, I have, you know, 10 cards and one of them is blank. What do I fill it in? And this is how they happen to show it? Or this is the intended alignment of these 10 cards. And using that alignment, I'm supposed to find a rule. It's not really clear which of those it is. Otherwise, I, I'm not really, I'm not really seeing much. I mean, I still pretty much just see you, <laughs> right? Yeah, I'm just, um, I'm really not sure why they have the letters arranged this way, if it's intentional or not. I'd like to think it's intentional. I feel like it has to be intentional. <laughs> Given the uh, the two T's on top of the two S's and the F on top of the E, I feel like that has to be intentional. 
is it all supposed to spell a word? Because if so, I'm having a really tough time coming up with it. Something that ends with scent or ents or scents. <laughs> I feel like the order can't matter, because I can't make a reasonable, I guess like, I don't know, like one-to-one -one relationship between the two rows, right? If I imagine I have to take S and do something to it to get either O or T, it, it doesn't matter because when I look at the next S, the only options available are T and T. I'll try O. I'll try O, given that the only thing I can think of is that bottom row to upper right, like progression, right? Where it's like S to T, then S to T, then E to F, then N to O. Although then T, you know, doesn't lead to anything and O doesn't have anything leading into it. So that makes me, that's why I went with U first. I'll try the O. I'll try the O, but otherwise... Otherwise, I can't really think of much, guys. That should do it. I can't think of a word, I can't think of other things, and it's not O, it's not U. Uh, I suppose I thought wrong. Look for a pattern or rule that applies to this arrangement of letters. I'll keep trying. We're losing pigrettes quickly, guys. So the way they said that arrangement of letters makes it seem that it's not random and that this specific arrangement is very intentional. Meaning I need to infer some sort of relationship between the different letters in order to deduce what the blank letter is. And if the arrangement matters... Hmm... I don't know, guys. I don't know. Um, maybe it's, you know, maybe I'm way overthinking it. Maybe it's something super blatantly obvious. I, I don't really know, though. Um, I mean, I've already mentioned the relationships or the rules or patterns that I could see. I think at this point, I mean, I don't know if I really want to sit around and think on this for much longer. I do want to solve it. <laughs> Maybe this is time where we finally use a hint on, on a 20 picarette puzzle of all... I mean, sure. We'll, you, we'll, we'll use a hint. First hint of the run. If you're guessing that there's some order to the way the cards are lined up, you're absolutely correct. Think about what series of things could be represented here. Think about what series of things could be represented here. I mean, I'm fairly confident it's alphabet, like letters of the alphabet. Maybe not. <laughs> Maybe not, but... Um... Days of the week? Or something like that? <laughs> but then where do the E, N, and O come in, right? That wasn't very helpful. We're gonna use another hint. How many cards do you have there? Ten, right? That's a bigger hint than you think. Look closely at which card is blank. So the fact that there are 10 cards is really big. Look closely at which card is blank. Hmm. <laughs> I get it. Wow, I'm... I'm shocked that this is a 20 pick rat puzzle. So, the... Unbelievable. Um, 
It's just the first letter of whatever digit if you were to order these from 1 through 10. So it's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, making it an F, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. That is not at all intuitive to me, if you ask me. Regardless, I mean, there, there we go. That was not... That was not a good F. Hmm. Neither was that, apparently. Let's see if this will classify as an F in their books. Nope. How do they want me to draw an F? I mean, it's not, you know, super neat, but... It's, uh... It's pretty clearly an F, if you ask me, though. <laughs> And the thing is, I can't, you know, pick up the stylus without without it just automatically accepting my letter. This is not what I expected to be the difficult part of the puzzle, guys. <laughs> How about something like that? Nope. They definitely want an uppercase F. We're gonna make we're gonna make this as clearly an F as possible. Interesting. I don't know how to more clearly write an F. I really don't. <laughs> how do I do this, guys? Why isn't it working? I have to go from the bottom up or something? <sighs> this is not the frustration I expected to encounter in Professor Layton, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen. <sighs> Alright, well, I guess we'll be here a moment while I try to get this to write correctly. Actually, I'm just gonna Google it up. I'll... <sighs> Let's see. There we go. Did you guys see that? I had to do it really quickly and then it changed very quickly from an R to an F. It's so weird, it seemed to be like, based on the fact that it was one stroke versus two strokes, that it was giving me difficulty. Okay, weird. Anyways, we'll submit that. Luke, here's my answer. And of course, that's Another correct. Puzzle solved. Yeah, I don't, I don't think that would have ever occurred to me. I don't think that would have ever occurred to me without um, those hints. And like I've mentioned in the very first episode, I really hate to use hints. I really like to come up with these things on my own. But especially with ones where it's just kind of like you have to sit there and look at it and you can't really deduce much or try much, um, it may be necessary. Well, it looks like you solved it all right. Of course, we all knew a brainiac like you would solve it. If in, if in you're looking for the cafe, it's right there. But it's way past that kid's bedtime, you know? Way past. Besides, the tower could start making noise again at any time, yeah? Trust me on this one, Professor. Get back to the inn, yeah. Yeah, get back to the inn. Okay, um... So we've obtained some more furniture. And I think now that we've gotten over the fact that, yeah... Um, hints will probably be necessary. I do want to look at the puzzle index and go back to that alien one to see if I can use a hint for that. Where is it? Puzzled aliens. Can I give it a go, or...? Do I actually have to go back to find it? I think I do. Let's go do that. I, I kind of want to just get it over with because, again, like I said, I've thought about it every now and then and I don't think it's going to occur to me. And I'd much rather have, at this point, a hint. So we'll talk. Opening a hole in a piece of paper to mark it so that other humans or other earthlings can see it.
I don't know. The only thing is maybe there's like a very broad interpretation of paper, right? With the intention of showing where the hole is. Where are people looking for a hole in a piece of paper? Unless there's, yeah, a really broad interpretation of paper, like to involve like clothing. I don't really know. They want one word. So, yeah, I'm gonna go for a hint here. Even something as common as paper can look bizarre to someone who's never seen it before. What kind of device puts holes in paper? It must have a needle or sharp point on it. Hmm. What kind of device puts holes in paper? It must have a needle or sharp point on it. I mean, there's a hole puncher, right? There's also a stapler. What kind of device puts holes in paper? I don't know, guys. Does this really help all that much? What kind of device puts holes in paper? It must have a needle or sharp point. Hmm. All right, looks like hint number two it is. <laughs> the subject uses a needle to punch a hole in a sheet of paper. Then it's used to draw a solid line around the hole. Since it draws a line, it must have some sort of writing implement attached to it. Something with a needle on it that you punch a hole in a sheet of paper and then you draw a solid line around the hole using it? Yeah, I still don't I still don't really think of anything that has a needle that goes through paper with a writing instrument attached to it. So that you can draw a line around the hole. It's safe to say that very few people ever use these once they grow up and join the working world. However, because of math classes, starting number startling number of students probably have one in their bag or their desk at home. Is it, is it a compass? You put a needle in a paper? I mean, you don't really put, make a hole that way though, or open up a hole. It's not a straight edge. <laughs> yeah, all I can, all I can think of is a compass. I guess, I guess we'll give it a go. C O M P Oh, it's going to want me to uh Nope. It's going to be difficult to do the A, I guess. <laughs> With the with all these like second or like two stroke letters, it's gonna be difficult. Is it a compass? Let's see, there I guess. I never in a million Another years would have gotten that. A compass? Really? It's pretty much spot on. No, no, it's not. You don't open a hole with a compass. You don't. It has a needle on it so that it has like one, you know, fixed point that you push down on or apply pressure to and that it'll stay fixed as you move, you know, the the writing utensil part of it around it. But it's not like you're even doing that to show other people where the hole is the presumed hole that you're that you're creating with the compass yeah I don't I don't I don't like it <laughs> I don't like it at all guys maybe some of you do but I don't I don't really like that puzzle I mean I guess I can't be surprised if there are one or two you know that 
of you know hundreds of puzzles that aren't going to you know do their best or or be that great. But still, you know, I've heard that if you aren't careful walking around St. Mysterio at night, you can run into trouble. But Raymond wasn't being careful. What exactly do you mean? And she's off. We got a painting scrap. Not a gizmo though. Okay. Well. Well, that was a puzzle. <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that, guys. I'm glad I used hints on that, because I never in a million years would have considered a compass as doing what it was describing. So, yeah. I, I, like I've mentioned earlier, I really, really dislike having to use hints. But if it's absolutely necessary, I mean, for the sake of getting the puzzle, um, I'll take some time to think on it. I'll think on it. But if I don't see any way forward, anything to try, anything to give it an extra go at, um, then I'd rather not waste my time. Anyways, we have a couple people here. Obviously, we could, we could go in the cafe. We're supposed to go in the cafe. But there are some people here that probably have puzzles for us. It must be a drag having to keep up your investigation all through the night. How about a puzzle to break, take off the edge? I've got just the puzzle for a night like this. Of course. Monster. Interesting. Oh no, the town is in grave peril. As you read this, a fearsome monster is launching an attack on St. Mysterio. Oh no, whatever will we do? Ward off the beast by stabbing it in the eye. And for goodness sake, hurry. <laughs> so, the point is, we're supposed to stab... We're supposed to identify the monster um, and stab it in the eye. And it's... Is launching an attack on Saint Mystere. Ward off the beast by stabbing in the eye. And for goodness sake, so we're supposed to find the eye, right? And there are a lot of things that look like eyes. The the tree here, our Deku tree, supposedly has eyes. There are plenty of stars. There's a star on top of a tree. There's the moon. There's this tower on the left that has the two windows. Um, there are the you know the buildings on the right and the other towers that have multiple windows. There's the cat that has an eye. There's the person with two eyes. And then in that building at the very bottom of the screen, it looks like there's a window that has two eye-shaped figures. If I had to guess, that would be my initial guess at what a monster is. I don't think they're referring to the cat as the monster, nor the person, though they look a little bit zombie-like given their posture. But you know, I look kind of zombie-like when I haven't gotten a lot of sleep, so maybe, maybe that's not the case. Um, the, the bottom of the screen looks very monster-like, so I think that's ultimately what I'll go with. <laughs> I love, I love it, the sword. <laughs> that's so funny. Yep, naturally we can choose those as options too, but I think, I think that's it down there. Because I, I can't see it being a window or even, you know, I can't see any other way that, like when you look at it, right? It doesn't look like those are maybe lanterns or something else. They, those have to be the eyes. Luke, here's my answer. Let's take a look. That's not it. Oh, how embarrassing. All right. Um, I guess we'll keep taking a look. I, I don't know why that's incorrect. <laughs> why can't the beast be inside one of the buildings? St. Mysterio, ward off the beast by stabbing it in the eye, and for goodness sake, hurry. Those look like beast eyes to me. Even down to the, you know, like the shape of them, and I can't see them being anything else. So I don't know how we would deduce that they're not. You know, there are other things we could clearly deduce are not beast eyes, right? Um, I guess? What about the tree? Maybe that's what they want us to deduce? Is that a tree shouldn't have any light source within it? So when you look at the tree, it's like, oh, why Why does it have, you know, lit up yellow, white eye-like things on it? Um, I mean, you theoretically could have, you know, a hole in a tree with a light source in it, but I guess it's unlikely. I mean, that's the best, that's the next best thing I've got. For me, it was most reasonable that there would be some monster hiding or lurking in one of the houses, given the, that eye shape before. 
but presumably it could also be this there we go. I like structure on the tree. All right, I guess that's not what they wanted me to I do either. I felt wrong. <laughs> okay, game. I think that's also a pretty reasonable deduction, right? Is that a tree shouldn't have such a shape, such a colored shape on it. And so those would be reasonable to be eyes. Those are the only things I can reasonably deduce. The other thing is maybe, maybe what they want us to say is that the eye isn't actually something Are they really letting me... Oh, so I can really pinpoint this wherever I want. Did I just, like, miss? Earlier? I don't know. It doesn't even just lock onto certain things. I can literally, you know, put the sword anywhere. So maybe I just missed the correct placement. I don't know. Um, the only other thing I can think of is if they're doing some sort of like word trickery and they say specifically in the eye, meaning it should only have one eye. I don't think that's the case. Doesn't seem very likely to me. But um, but it could be a point of, of trickery they're aiming for. And if that were the case, that would make me think that it's the cat. But I don't know. I think I'm going to go with a hint for this one. At a glance, the picture appears to be filled with glowing objects that could well be eyes. But remember, there's only one monster attacking the village. Well, well, duh. <laughs> right? I mean, if you ask me, the cat could be considered the monster. That person could be considered the monster. This tree with weird eye-like structures on it could be a monster. Um, in this window lurking here could be a monster. So we're gonna go with a second hint. In fact, it's so big that it could well cover the whole of the town. The monster is huge. In fact, it's so big that it could well cover the whole of the town. Are they talking about like the night sky? Do they want me to like click on the moon here? that it could cover the whole town. There's only only the sky, really. I guess we'll try that. If that's the answer, I don't really like it. <laughs> Luke, here's my answer. We'll give it a go though. Wow. I um Every puzzle has an answer. Well, I I know how I feel about that puzzle. I don't like that at all. It seems the fiend was hiding in the night sky. You certainly gave it what for? Yeah, that doesn't make sense to me <laughs> that doesn't make sense to me I guess like you could portray you know figuratively the the knight as a beast overcoming the city and figuratively its eye could be the the moon but I feel like there's significantly more I guess concrete other th answers that are plausible too that there's very little that would initially put push me in that direction. Oh well, I guess, right? <laughs> you sure devoured that puzzle. Seeing as it's getting late, I should warn you both about the kidnapper that's been sneaking about town. Make sure you don't get snatched up walking around St. Mysterio. That'd be grade A shame. You get another painting scrap. Lovely. Okay, now... There's been a little bit of idle time where I've been thinking about things that I might edit out. So I, I do want to try one more puzzle. Assuming, of course, this lady's going to give us one. Mime, aren't the two of you up late playing detective? If you like solving mysteries so much, do me a favor and help me with a puzzle, would you? Of course. Of course. Fish thief. Okay. When you weren't looking, someone came by and gobbled up your fish dinner. The three brothers near the scene of this dastardly crime had this to say. A, B, and C. All right. A. Me? Oh, yeah. I ate it. It was good, too. B. I saw A eat that fish right up. C. B and I didn't eat that fish. One of these three brothers is lying. Okay. So one of them is lying. And only one of them. I 
we're going to presume that's what they mean. But which one? So here's the thing, right? If A is lying, then B is also lying. So A can't be lying. So A is telling the truth. <laughs> um, so it's not A. We're, and again, we're asked to figure out which brother is lying, not who ate it, who is lying, right? And so if we know that only one of them is lying, again, A can't be the liar because if A were lying, then B would also be lying. And that would be two as opposed to one. And from that previous problem, I'm pretty sure they mean this in exact terms, not just general terms. Um, so now we look at B. What if B is lying? I saw A eat that fish right up. That, you know, could be, that could be a lie. It could be true. There's nothing that doesn't really have a relation with the other statements. Um, and we know that again, A, is telling the truth, so, so A did eat it, but that doesn't mean B necessarily saw it. C, B and I didn't eat that fish. That's also true if A did eat it, and we assume one brother ate it. I guess theoretically it could be multiple brothers, um, but I don't think that's what they're trying to aim for here. So yeah, I think A and C are telling the truth and B is the liar. Because if, if C were lying, and that meant, that would mean that B or C ate the fish, which would mean A is also lying, which would mean more than one brother is lying. So it has to be B in this case. Oh, that's yeah, the submit know. button there. I clicked it thinking it would like circle or... Really? Oh, how embarrassing. I'm fairly confident I... 24 out of 35. Oh, man. This has not been the best episode. <laughs> it's not been the best. Me? Oh, yeah, I ate it. It was good, too. One of these three brothers is lying. Two are telling the truth. If C is lying, then either B or C ate it which would mean A is also lying. So it can't be C. And if A, and if A is lying and didn't eat it, then B is also lying because B couldn't have seen it. Although I guess, well, no, because if A is telling the truth and C is telling the truth, then, and we assume one of them is lying, B would have to be the liar. Unless I'm just misinterpreting what the meaning of B is. Because whether or not A eats it doesn't really have any impact on whether or not B saw A eat it. And it's not B, apparently. <laughs> and it's not B, apparently, just from the just from the answer choice we tried, though I was fairly confident in that logic. Maybe B's statement that A ate the fish is meant to be like an ass assertion that A ate it. Not an actual comment on whether or not B saw A eat it, but instead that A ate it. Like I said, there is the possibility that more than one of them ate it. And if that's the case, C could be a liar. And A and B could be telling the truth. Knowing that B also ate it. If A and B also ate it, A would be telling the truth, B would still be telling the truth, and C would be lying. That's the only solution that I see. if we take B to mean that, and like an assertion that A ate the fish, not necessarily a very literal commentary on, or comments on whether or not B physically saw A eating the fish. I'm gonna go with C. That's the only thing I can see, really. That should do it. I guess.
guess that's correct. Let's see what explanation Another they have. Puzzle solved. The liar here is C. A and C split your dinner in each ate half. That's not even the result I ended up with. The answer becomes clear when you realize that if A is lying, and A didn't eat it, B must be lying as well. The same thing happens when you assume that B is the liar. Therefore, the only possible answer is that C is lying, a scenario that only works if C actually did eat some of the fish. I wish they explained a little bit more. The same thing happens when you assume that B is the liar. So I think they were going for a less literal interpretation there, and instead saying that B's statement was an assertion that A ate the fish. Because that's the only way that you get that. Um, otherwise, there's no relation there whether or not A lies, right? Because A very well could have eaten it and B could have just said, Oh, like I, I said that I, that I saw him eating it, but I didn't actually see him eating it. Um, but if you consider B a statement of, oh, A ate it, and if B is lying, meaning A did not eat it, then A is also lying. And that's how they get to C. I think that's what they wanted the interpretation to be, and that's how they got this answer. But, but again, I don't think that's clear from the statement they gave B. <laughs> so, um... Wow. Uh, well, you took care of that one in a hurry, didn't you? And here I thought that you were just another well-dressed city slicker. <laughs> you showed me. Well, I believe one good turn deserves another, so why not let me take a look at your fortune? Oh, this isn't good. I see a series of inauspicious events occurring during your stay in St. Monsieur. Watch your step. I'll do my best. And Luke will get the tele television. Gotta play those video games. Okay. Well, I, I partially wanted to do that puzzle because I haven't really enjoyed the puzzles in this episode that much, and I was optimistic that the last one would be more enjoyable. Um, but alas, I didn't really like any of the puzzles. <laughs> so, this was admittedly a relatively disappointing episode where I think some of the puzzles were a bit of a stretch. Uh, maybe it's me. Maybe it's, you know, my inability to see what the game was going for. And maybe for 99% of people playing the game, it was obvious and I'm the odd one out here. Um, I don't think that's the case, but maybe it is. Either way, I mean, like I mentioned earlier, win a game with hundreds of puzzles, there are bound to be a few that don't quite click as well as maybe the, the puzzle creators intended. Um, but nevertheless, it's a cool game. Still enjoy the game. <laughs> it is unfortunate it's, I waited a few days and excitedly came back to the game only to be disappointed by the puzzles I played. But the story is cool, the aesthetic is cool, the music's lovely. And I am still optimistically looking forward to future parts, and I hope you guys are too. Um, I hope you guys weren't too frustrated by my thoughts during this episode. I know it can be uh, difficult to watch somebody struggling through something you know the answer to. Um, but I hope at the very least you guys can see where I'm coming from, and that's uh, something entertaining to see. And yeah, I'll... I'll guess, I guess I'll continue the story, right? We have to explore the paths to the right of the cafe, and then what comes up past the cafe, and potentially some other area, because I know that last time we explored the city, we completely missed an area. Um, but then we'll finally go to the cafe and try to figure out what the heck is going on with Ramon, or Raymond. Why do I keep going back and forth on that pronunciation? <laughs> Anyways, I'll see you guys in the next episode. But until that next episode, this is Moon Knight Zero, and this mission is complete.